Good morning and welcome to the Post Monetary Policy Committee press briefing. This is a briefing hosted by the Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya after the Monetary Policy Committee meeting that was held yesterday. Today is March the 30th, 2022. The MPC held its meeting yesterday, which is the 29th of March, 2022. As is usual, the Governor will go through his statement uh, without interruption and we shall then come back to a session where we can have a question and answer part. If you want to ask your questions, please do so via Slido. That's www.slido.com. The meeting code is MPC0322. MPC0322. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Jeroge. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, welcome again to this briefing following our MPC meeting yesterday. When we last met, who would have predicted the current external conjuncture? The COVID pandemic appears to be abating, but of course with significant scarring of the population and indeed of our various systems. A major war is taking place in Europe and prospects of even um, a world war, sliding into a world war, are quite real. Record high oil prices and other commodities in the global market. Record high inflation in the major economies, something that hasn't been seen in more than 30 years in some cases, and indeed, uh, yeah, more than 30 years in some cases. And let's not forget the ravages of climate change. All these things have become much more present um, than they were just a mere two months ago when we last met. In the course of this uh, briefing, I will inform you how the MPC yesterday looked at this conjunction and uh, how we ended up um, coming up with the, or how we ended up at the decision that we made, and I'm sure you've already seen the, uh, the, the communique, the press release that was issued last night covering uh, the decision, but indeed also covering the background to it. First off is the global developments. Over the last two months, we have witnessed a dramatic worsening of the global outlook, a change in the balance of risks, and a revaluation of the policy choices in the advanced economies. First off, vaccination progresses, including in Kenya. And uh, there's the usual slide that uh, we have been showing you. And you can see there has been progress. But I think even in Kenya, fully vaccinated, 8.9. Um, and uh, even about more than a quarter of a million people have received booster uh, booster doses, booster shots, and total vaccinations are at 12 million. So this is progressing at pace, and of course we again continue to encourage everybody to um, remind everyone else that they're in touch with to get the vaccines. It is important to be vaccinated in order for all of us to be safe. That is one thing, but I think at the same time, we have had travel bans um, and restrictions have been lifted. And I think we are, in a sense, easing towards normalcy or some semblance of normalcy, even though the normalcy may not be where we started off back in 2020. There are still lingering concerns about a resurgence of uh, the um, COVID uh, um, yeah, COVID, an outbreak of COVID again, um, in whichever form, in terms of, let's say, the, the various uh, um, variants. Um, as we have seen also in China, it, so that issue still remains on the table, and therefore it calls for caution um, in terms of the way we approach the various measures, protective measures that we still have in place. Secondly, the all benchmarks of oil prices 
oil prices have posted all-time record highs. So Marban is this slide that we are showing you, Marban oil, and again, this is our benchmark oil here in Kenya. And you can see for several years, um, actually since 2021, we started off uh, quite low. As a matter of fact, even before that, um, back in, uh, in, in uh, April of 2020, it was at $20 a barrel. That was sort of like the bottom, $20 a barrel from $60 a barrel in 2019, an average of uh, about $60 a barrel in 2019. And you can see how this sort of developed, how the price of oil, Marban oil, uh, Marban crude oil um, rose. And at December 2021, it was at uh, $79 a barrel. And you can see after that, it has shot up to a peak of $130, $130 a barrel, and has since moderated. Um, in this slide, we, we are showing it at uh, 112, but actually yesterday, it was $110.06 per barrel. It's still north of $100 a barrel. So even though it has come down um, from 130, it's still very high relative to what it used to be, etc. So this is obviously a cause of concern. Thirdly, we have the Russia-Ukraine war. Aside from the war itself, the question we have is what is the impact on our economy? I think first we have to appreciate the, dev the devastating, um, let's say, how devastating the war is for the citizens of Ukraine and the refugees. We've seen those photos of refugees trying to cross into the neighboring countries, etc. That obviously is distressing for all of us. But coming closer home in terms of the economic impact, I think the first one is that uh, the prospects, which we were very real, prospects of expanding tourism um, by having more travelers or more tourists from Ukraine and Russia. Um, as a matter of fact, they had, already ha they had already had some charter flights that were coming into Mombasa from the Ukraine. Now, all those prospects have been put on hold, um, understandably so. Then, of course, you have the merchandise trade. And uh, the slides that you, you have before you, first and foremost, uh, Russia and Ukraine are among the top five global exporters of, uh, let's say, cereals, um, grain, and oil seed. Um, I particularly like the sunflower oil uh, and the color of uh, the, if you remember the color of the Ukrainian flag is uh, that yellow sun flag, I mean it's related to the sunflower. So that is actually their national uh, flower. Um, but anyway, so let's begin with the others. I think the ones that matter to us of course are wheat and you can see uh, the impact. A lot of uh, wheat is imported um, or rather share of wheat trade in the global markets from Russia is 24% and uh, Ukraine 10%. So that is 34% already. Um, sunflower oil, as you can see, they really dominate, you know, 70, almost 75%. And uh, another commodities which are not here, this is only grain, um, obviously impact on the oil market and importantly on the gas exports to um, to the European destinations, Germany, etc. Um, the next slide shows shows the share of wheat exports for selected countries, um, and I think here you can see Kenya. Uh, Kenya is about forty, I guess, forty three, forty four percent. Um, so this is the share of wheat exports. Uh, sorry, wheat imports. Um, that we get and how much of that is from these two countries. So almost half of our imports, 44%, really is from uh, uh, those two countries and therefore it, it will cause some impact on uh, our 
imports of uh, wheat um, until we can, let's say, redirect our import our sources to different countries such as Argentina and other countries that are obviously dominant in terms of uh, wheat exports. Um, the next one is obviously the impact on the on the uh, on on the global food prices, and I think this is the first one. Of course, is grain. Um, this is an index that is done by the ANGTAD, and uh, basically just look at the direction, the grain prices or the index of uh, the price of grain um, has surged in the recent uh, period this year, and that's the peak towards the end, and the others as well, other commodities and indeed also agriculture. So this is something that shows you that uh, it, is, it is of concern to us um, and also other countries. It's important, and I'm sorry to belabor this, to also understand how important are this, um, let's say, trade with uh, Russia and Ukraine. So exports to Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine in uh, 2021 accounted for about one and a half, 1.4 percent and 0.1 percent respectively, so total one and a half percent of total Kenyan exports. And if you look at the composition of that, uh, tea was dominant. So you can say that actually in terms of uh, tea and cut flowers were really the significant exports to those countries, ex representing 50% in either case and about 25% in, uh, in the case of uh, cut flowers. Um, the other thing, of course, is the question about the imports. What are we doing on the import side? And you can see in terms of... Uh, Imports, they accounted for, again, about uh, 3%, um, 3% of uh, total Kenyan imports, and uh, Russia was 1.8 and 0.9 was Ukraine. And the composition of imports from Russia, wheat, dominates. Um, so that 1.8, about half of it, uh, was, from, um, was accounted for by wheat imports that is Kenyan imports. And uh, in the case of uh, Ukraine as well, uh, you can see about 75% of that is, uh, is wheat. Um, so wheat obviously dominates in terms of uh, the imports. Then um, I think, bef so, I guess the, the summary of that is um, even though they are dominant, um, we, we have uh, significant uh, trade um, sort of possibilities. We had significant trade possibilities with those countries. I think wheat is a concern, but again, in terms of numbers, it's not so dominant, and uh, hopefully um, that can be redirected or sourced from other countries that are in the wheat market. Now we move on to other things and uh, I want to remind ourselves that indeed supply chain problems remain. Um, so we talked about this last time. There are supply chain problems and uh, those will remain until they are dealt with. Then we have inflation. Um, inflation has become significant in the advanced economies you have a slide there that shows the developments, but I think it is more important to look at it towards the end. Um, for instance, the U.S., the United States, last number, last print was at 7.9% uh, in February, which was a 40-year high. And, it, we ex and this is expected to actually surge towards double digits and could be in the double digits sometime you know, post-July, sometime in their summer. The UK, the inflation, the CPI inflation, the, in February was 6.2%. 6.2%, which is a 30-year high. And indeed, in the Eurozone, um, all-time high of 5.8%. And all this have not fully, these numbers have not fully incorporated the energy price increases that have been seen, say, in the last month. So 
we expect to see these numbers to rise. That's the print, um, the CPI outcomes or the inflation outcomes in those economies, the advanced economies, to, um, to continue to rise. Um, so it offers the authorities in those countries, obviously, different policy choices from the ones that they had, say, uh, at a few two months ago, back in January, um, or even for that matter, towards the end of uh, 2021. And the policy choices, or should we say the policies that are, that are being considered, I think the first of this is uh, fuel price subsidies um, that, uh, that for pump prices, and indeed more generally fuel prices, you can think of gas in the European uh, destinations, etc. So this really direct relief measures, fuel price subsidies, and they are not only being considered, they've been put in place. And, you know, for instance, from Australia to Germany, from the UK to the US, all these countries have had to take steps to, to actually, in some sense, protect the, their population from the increased prices um, that are being uh, forecasted, or should we say, uh, been seen um, in, the, in those economies. Secondly, diplomatic pressures have been uh, brought to bear on the producing countries, the producing oil producing economies, um, so as to maintain, indeed lower the prices. Um, and uh, we know that uh, this will continue. As a matter of fact, just now there's the OPEC meeting this week, um, but I, obviously we don't know what the outcomes are of those meetings. Um, but we continue, and again, we do understand it's not just a one meeting solution. It probably will take a bit more time and consideration uh, by all concerned. Thirdly, monetary policy. Uh, last year, there was a lot of conversations about, uh, let's say, the tapering of uh, quantitative easing and uh, whether inflation was temporary, uh, etc., or transitory. I think all those conversations have just gone out the window. And what is clear now is that all these economies are ramping up uh, the, um, the interest rates in short order. And uh, this, in my view, is the equivalent of you know, stomping on the brakes, doing a handbrake turn. And uh, you can imagine there are consequences uh, for that. Um, some that could be quite dire particularly for the most vulnerable. So in some sense, we do understand the, their policy choices and we appreciate their difficult policy choices. Bottom line, there are significant risks of policy mistakes um, and also financial market turmoil as we go ahead as, uh, into the, well, in the, over the next month or two. But I think here is where we need to watch this space carefully um, and, uh, of course, encourage our counterparts in those economies uh, to really work hard to lower the, oil, the, the um, let's say, the price of oil in the global market. Secondly, uh, we are still waiting for revised forecasts um, that is on the global, uh, global outlook and global growth, uh, which will certainly scale down the growth prospects in 2022. Um, the IMF is expected to issue their view forecast in the next couple of weeks, I believe. And so we are waiting for that. So let me switch then to the domestic economy. And the first item here is obviously inflation. Um, we have, uh, you already have seen these numbers, the February outcomes. Um, the overall number was at 5.1. And uh, I think you can see uh, first on the blue, which is the food inflation, um, that had come down to 8.7, and fuel inflation has come down uh, to uh, 6, I believe it's 5 point, I'm sorry, yeah, yes, yeah, 6.5, and uh, non-food, non-fuel remains well below 3%, it's at 2%. And uh, we expect to see the March numbers tomorrow, and uh, our expectation is that 
that will be along the same as uh, February, meaning uh, give or take, uh, let's say, one or two po uh, points, two points. Um, but a point here again is that uh, the inflation remains well anchored based on first, the food prices are expected to moderate uh, as the rains come. And this we have seen every time uh, when the rains come. And as you know, now it's raining, at least even here in Nairobi, even though actually out there in the, in the food growing areas, there has been some, the, the rains arrived uh, earlier. And uh, anyway, so there's a lot more, uh, there's real prospects of food prices coming down, uh, those that were elevated because of shortages, etc. Secondly, the government measures to subsidize fuel prices, and that has been there for some time. I think the government has spoken uh, uh, quite loudly about this, and uh, they, in a sense, they've uh, taken that measure to subsidize the pump prices, if, if you want to call it that. Um, in a sense, providing that, those rel that relief uh, to our consumers, all of us. Also appreciating that uh, there's a significant second round effects of uh, increases in price of fuel. It uh, goes into many other products, um, not just transportation, um, or rather transportation, even moving of uh, agricultural produce from the farms to, let's say, the markets. You know, that costs fuel, etc. So it has, uh, it, it impacts on many other let's say, products, and that's the second round effect that uh, obviously would be concerned about. That said, um, we do understand that there would be a sticker price shock for some commodities. And uh, this, I think, is what has happened to a lot of us. You go to a store and, uh, or kiosk or market, and you are looking for, I don't know, a particular commodity. And then the price that is there is much higher than what you have been used to. And there's that sticker price shock, and it's a real shock. But I think the point here is that uh, it's not in every single commodity, and that's why you can say even though the CPI is at, the inflation as measured by the CPI was at 5.1, it does appreciate that, or uh, we do appreciate that there could be specific prices that are much higher um, and it may be some of the prices that maybe you don't spend a lot of uh, your income, your disposable income on, but uh, it is still significant. I think the point I'm making is, uh, this is, pro well, uh, the point is well made. Secondly, we also know that they are unscrupulous business people, you know, um, out there. And uh, they will take advantage or they'll seek to take advantage of any crisis. There's no crisis that they cannot uh, take advantage of. And I think this is sad. This is really sad. And we saw this in the context of the COVID, um, COVID measures, right? I think you know of uh, those very bad stories. Um, people's lives are at stake. But yet, we had unscrupulous businessmen businessmen and businesswomen doing the unthinkable. We also saw this in the context of, let's say, importation of adulterated sugar, right? I mean, these are, this is, this are not folk stories for us. This is the reality for us. And I think they need to be called out on those things because it is not an issue of pricing. It's an issue of being unscrupulous and being, well, this, these are crimes, and I think they need to be called for what they are. So that's what I want to say about inflation, and uh, I want now to move to the performance of uh, the other sectors. Um, what we, so this is, I guess I wasn't expecting this slide, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, I was expecting another slide, but that's okay. So let's first, uh, what I'm being uh, pushed towards is uh, doing the, uh, the, the external sector first, and we'll do that. 
So here we have exports, right? We already talked about uh, the, the changes that uh, are taking place in the Ukraine, but I think overall what we have seen is exports have continued to, uh, to grow um, as we had expected before, as we saw towards the end of uh, 2022, 2021. And these are the 12 month uh, values. So in each of these, you can see there has been uh, increase, in, including horticulture. I think it's important to point out horticulture because the recent volumes have been lower um, in terms of fruits, etc. But overall, the 12 month value um, you can see there's a modest growth. Um, then we have uh, um, imports, and this is uh, overall imports. I think there's, uh, again, they have, I think the one to point out is oil imports. You can see there's, it's significantly higher than where we were before. That is the 12th month to February of 2021, um, compared to 12th month, February 2022. So you can see that significant increase, but also the others. So across the board, there has been increases, but oil is significant. I also want to make the point, uh, the, the increase in the manufacture, machinery and transport goods, that also has been significant. You can see that this is all supporting the um, sort of uh, the, the resurgence of growth in the economy. Um, another slide, this is on imports, but it is by composition, uh, consumer goods, intermediate and capital goods. And the one I want to flag, of course, is the intermediate goods, excluding oil. And you can see it's grown from uh, 7.9 billion in the 12 months to February 2021 to 9.6 billion in the 12 months to 20, February 2022. Um, it shows, again, it supports, uh, let's say, the narrative of a strong manufacturing sector and other sectors as well, but definitely manufacturing. Um, this is, uh, an imp we haven't shown this slide before, but I think it is important to look at it. You see, there are significant, uh, the services sector, quite often we look at uh, the tourism sector or tourism earnings. And, but in effect, there are other elements in the services sector or the services, um, services elements in the, in the balance of payments. And so here you have uh, the various components of them. So for instance, on uh, transport, that's the, I guess, that's the orange line. Um, now, don't ask me whether the colors are orange or not, but anyway, that's orange. Um, and then you have the other components, travel, which we understand, that's the silver one, has been picking up. You can see all the way from uh, April of uh, 2021, these are growth rates. So since April 2021, there's a sort of significant reversal um, improving pickup, as it were. And that has continued. The financials as well, and indeed also ICT. ICT is surging through the roof. Um, and that I think is important for us to appreciate because there's a significant, let's say, uh, room to scale. Uh, so this can be scaled up dramatically. The this is a slide that you are familiar with, which is the number of tourists arriving. And you can see uh, in the period, the green, the green bars, that is January and February of 2022. Um, so we are going back to normalcy, but we are not there. And I think the prospects now are positive um, and, uh, and particularly also appreciating where, they, where our tourists come from. Um, so the direction of the, the, the source uh, economies. And the U.S. remains dominant. Uh, Europe also is, is significant. Um, but I think they are now reopening and the travel restrictions that were there before and the warnings that were there have been lifted. So the prospects in this are good. 
Um, the diaspora remittances, this is something we've discussed before. Um, strong these 12 months, you can see compared the 12 months uh, of, uh, uh, to 2021, significant growth. But I think what is what, one of the things that we need to appreciate is the seasonality. That is important. So we always see a significant increase in, uh, in, uh, in remittances in December, actually towards the end of the year, November, December, and January. And then it, uh, it comes, it moderates, it, come, it comes down. Um, and then it will pick up generally around April, May, Easter, and then eventually will remain high. And towards the summer, it will come down again, all the way to September, October, and then pick up again. So there's a clear seasonality if you look at the data. And, and uh, we have seen that seasonality playing out, et cetera. But as we said before, in the context of the diaspora survey that we did, um, one of the elements here is that uh, why this has increased or has improved and why we believe that there will be there are strong prospects of it remaining high, is that uh, the diaspora now, or those that are sending money, have more channels which are cheaper and for that matter more convenient. So you can do anytime, anywhere, right? Sending money um, from your mobile phone, wherever you are, in the US, in the UK, etc. cetera. Um, next is now the overall putting it all together, where are we? And I think uh, this is the current account deficit that we are now uh, projecting. It is 5.9, we are now projecting 5.9% of GDP for 2022. And really, um, aside from oil, the difference, we had 5.2 before. And uh, the change to 5.9 is entirely driven by the higher oil prices that we are expecting. So in, if, we, if, we, if we sort of abstract from the higher oil prices, we would actually be exactly where we were at 5.2% uh, of uh, GDP. Um, so what does that mean then in terms of the current account? Is we've given you 5.9, but also it is important to see what is happening in the rest of uh, the of the uh, well the other elements that are in, related to the external sector. And I think a big issue is the foreign exchange market. Um, first of all, is uh, what has happened to date. That is a, an, an updated slide as of March 24, um, and you can see the dollar. Uh, has remained strong. So again, it's a dollar index, meaning um, the dollar uh, versus all other countries, major countries. You can see the dollar has appreciated by 3.2%. Uh, and uh, most of the other, well, this is a chart that I'm sure you are familiar with. Um, of course, the exception at the end is Russian ruble, which had uh, depreciated by a lot more. And uh, now you can see it's only at 20%, 20% which is still significant. Um, next slide shows coming home uh, currencies that are uh, closer to us. And uh, I think you can see we are the one we have depreciated by 1.29, 1.3%. That is in the year 2022. Um, and you can see it matches well with the others. Um, including those in the East, uh, East African community, um, our neighbors. So I think we are, we, are, we are feeling okay in terms of operating the market, um, whether the market has been operating correctly. There has been, uh, there is liquidity in the market in terms of FX liquidity, and uh, we continue to observe it or to observe the market so that there is proper behavior um, as is required in operating those markets. Okay, so now I needed a cue, so we are moving to the, uh, to the 
to the rest, and that is the, uh, the, the, the other sectors, performance, the real sector, as it were. I want to, before going to the slides, I want to make a few points. The first of this is that we do not have any new data in terms of the, uh, let's say, GDP numbers um, from KNBS. We expect this to come uh, um, in April, uh, April, May, that sort of period. And uh, they will issue them, I think, in the context of the economic survey that they are preparing. But yes, we are waiting for the final, the, the initial numbers for uh, last quarter of 2021, and indeed the first numbers for all of 2021. Uh, we, our numbers, our estimates for 2021 have not changed. Um, so we are still projecting a growth, uh, or, or projecting, estimating a growth of 8% in the context of uh, all the numbers that we have seen so far. So that remains um, where it was when we explained it back in 20, uh, back in January, you can see it there. And, uh, and I think we have also looked at leading indicators. Uh, and I think the leading indicators for 2022, Q1 2022, show that there is uh, the dynamism that has that came into the economy towards uh, in 2021 has remained. And uh, that's why we are projecting growth in 2022 at uh, 5.9, which is pretty much where we were before. So those numbers haven't changed. Uh, they've not changed, but again, the point is they've not changed because we didn't want to change them. It's because the numbers point towards uh, significant dynamism. But I want us to go through um, maybe you should uh, show the other slide of the uh, uh, the indicators. Yeah, this slide. So this is the no the other slide. Yeah, this slide uh, shows you. I have I have used it before. Um, we'll generally not show this slide, but I think uh, it's important for you to see how things are turning out. So basically, the greens are the numbers from KNBS, the quarterly numbers. And the blues are our own uh, indicators, composite indices, composite index of economic activity. So we put in all the various indicators in the sectors, and then we have this composite index. So this is sort of our leading indicators sort of mixed together. And you can see for Q1, um, sorry, Q4 of 2021, uh, we are still projecting 8.3. And uh, for Q1 2022, uh, we are projecting 7.3. That is the blue. And I think the point is also to show that uh, our estimate have generally tracked the GDP numbers. Um, there are some parts where we are beat off, uh, particularly in Q2 of uh, 2021. And, uh, and, but I think the point is that this is a good, it shows credibility in terms of the, um, of the indicators. Then we move to the slides that we had before. Yes, and I'll just go very quickly through this. Um, the first, again, looking at some sectors, I'm not going to go through all of them. So the first of this is uh, transport and storage, and then of course accommodation and food. Uh, this is important because uh, they, were, they are really connected to the, let's say the tourism sector. And this was one of the sectors, the hotel and tourism sector generally were lagging. Uh, and uh, you can see it still picked up. Um, so transport and storage, that is the the deep blue, um, 2022, the deep blue. And you can see the growth rates are 20%, 21% compared to the month, the same month, January, February of 2021. Then on the, and again, this is sales turnover. Uh, it is important to point that. Uh, so it is much more, um, yeah, it has a lot more going on in there. 
Um, then on the accommodation and uh, food services, this is hotels, etc. Again, significant growth, 40 percent, 45 percent, and uh, again showing that there's dynamism in those sectors. It is true in the context of uh, the, the, the numbers at the end of uh, the year, that is December and early January, um, those obviously were pushed up by all the, uh, let's say, internal domestic uh, tourism that we did. But it is interesting to note that that hasn't gone down in February. Basically, the, what has happened now is we are getting, they are getting more of the conference tourism. Um, which were not there earlier in the, in the year, meaning in January, et cetera, and indeed last year. So you're getting a lot more of that, in, particularly in, the, uh, in Mombasa, in Naivasha, et cetera. Um, the, this is the 12th month. I was expecting other slides, but I think that's okay. So it's okay, it's okay, let's go. Okay. Okay, this is uh, credit growth in the various sectors. And uh, I think this just shows you the, I mean, the idea here is just to show the significant growth rate in some of the sectors, transport, and uh, communication, trade, uh, which obviously needs a lot of, um, generally if you're thinking of the usage of credit, trade is a significant one. And also manufacturing, um, it, the growth rate has moderated, but it's still high. So you're talking 10%, 7%, etc. On consumer durables, you can see the growth rate remains significantly high, 14%, etc. So. I think this is pretty much what I wanted to point out, that uh, the indicators at this moment are strong. And uh, the bottom line here is that we will revise our growth rates um, once we have the new numbers from KNBS. But at this moment, um, for January through, with all the indicators that we have, the point, for, the point to continued uh, growth you know, um, let's say dynamism in the economy across the sectors, etc. Um, the one area that I would probably flag, and it isn't here, that was one of the ones I wanted to show a little more of, but it's okay, um, is uh, agriculture. So there has been some mixed performance here, uh, not surprisingly. Um, and uh, last year, I think we, we, we made the point that agriculture is, uh, was not as strong. I think the chart that we showed just now um, can show that. But I think the point here is that there are mixed performance to date, uh, largely because uh, we expect on the prospects, for instance, we expect the rains will provide significant uh, um, well, lift to that sector. Most of our agriculture is rain fed. And, uh, and then, but there's the, other, there's the downside, which is on the fertilizer. And uh, our understanding is that this, uh, the farmers haven't received the fertilizer. You, the, it's hard to locate fertilizer or to buy fertilizer in the various stores. So there is a concern there. And uh, the problem, of course, is as we know about fertilizer usage, if it is not available when the farmers are planting, um, it is of no use. So that is a significant risk that I think we need to watch. So those are the points I wanted to raise uh, in terms of the, of the, um, of the uh, growth in the economy. Now, we'll make a few points on uh, the banking sector. Um, I think that covers all my slides, right? Uh, oh no, we needed to talk about the, the, uh, the service. I'm sorry we, we got our slides mixed up. Um, so I want to say a few points about the, the service. The, we do the three surveys. The first one is on the uh, CEO survey. And uh, we are expanding the, the coverage of this. Um, so we hope that we'll get 
more people participating in this. And if you are a CEO out there, I encourage you to contact us so that we can actually get your views uh, in the future. But the bottom line here is that uh, this is just one slide of uh, several. Um, so we pick up this. And it shows dynamism. It shows a lot of confidence, a lot of optimism, at least as presented by the CEOs. Right? So we are asking them their views. And what is clear is that the optimism that was there before uh, has been sustained uh, with regard to the prospects of the company and indeed also the sector of growth. And you can see how it has moved from January to March. Uh, on the left hand side, that is the company. And on the right hand side is January to March in terms of uh, the, the sector. So I think that is quite clear. Now, why, what was the source of their optimism? And the first is uh, um, the favorable weather in agriculture um, and uh, other things, infrastructure spending, uh, competitiveness, and the recovery of COVID-19. This is important. And we had seen it last time, we had seen it in January when we did this survey as well. And of course, other elements of Kenyan's resilience. The concerns that they raised is obviously the higher commodity prices. And uh, this has been coming through. And uh, there's a slide I'll show in a minute. And indeed, the supply chain disruptions. And you know, think about even transporting things here. You know, import, importing of a 40 foot container or packaging material, et cetera. Those prices have gone up significantly. And we are caught, um, we are, in some sense, we are collateral damage in the, in the global economy because we are small and we cannot really be, uh, we are price takers um, in the global economy. Um, of course, there's a lot of optimism in the, in the Kenyan and global economies which, which has been dampened uh, by concerns of uh, the Russian, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war and the other problems that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's another slide here which relates to the op their optimism in the, con in the country's prospects over the next 12 months, and that remains strong. So you're now not talking uh, short term, you're talking, uh, well, it is one year, let's say, so over the next year. And you can see the last uh, column, um, the columns on the, yeah, the last in each of the panels, you have the banks on the left-hand side and non-banks on the right-hand side. And you can see that actually that remains strong. Um, so if you're thinking of, uh, for instance, uh, how many of these have been, um, what percentage of banks, responding banks, um, were optimistic? And you can see that it's 90%. Um, that is significant. Moving on to other, other, the next uh, survey is the hotel survey. Um, and uh, again, um, this is just uh, elements from the surveys. And the surveys will be put out in the next couple of days and you can look at the detailed um, results there. But the hotel, hotel surveys show the following. First, all the hotels that we, we uh, surveyed of or responding hotels were open. And uh, I think also we appreciate that there are some others that are about to open. Uh, for instance, the, so the Radisson Blue in Nairobi um, will be opening shortly, I believe April, May, around that time, time, time zone or time band. And also what used to be called the Norfolk Hotel will probably be opened again around the same sort of uh, time. So these are significant, uh, let's say, hotels that are now coming back on stream. There are still some that are closed. We talked about the former international, intercontinental, etc. But I think the point here is that in terms of availability of uh, you know, space or hotels, yeah, beds, etc., um, that is significant. Uh, then in terms of, uh, this is a slide that talks about employment. And, uh, and I think the point here is that uh, uh, that has, relative to pre-COVID, 
um, it's, it's, it's edging up. So we are, we are in the 80s, 80% as it were, you know, 80 plus. But I think the point here is uh, um, there's still some ways to go. And I think also in terms of composition, you know, casuals versus uh, permanent, that is obviously a concern. Um, I think the, the hotels need to get to a space that they feel confident that uh, they can take on people on a permanent basis, of which they are already doing. Um, and I think it is to good effect. Uh, then the forward bookings, I think that's the next slide. And uh, you can see in, um, for May, well, I think the, the slide is sort of self-explanatory uh, with one kind of yet, which is the footnote um, that many hotels depend on walking clients. Um, and this is particularly for us Kenyans, right? Um, so decisions are made very much at the last minute or the last day, which is probably not very fulfilling, but uh, anyway, so be it. Um, but I think the point here is that these numbers are better than, say, what we had seen before. We'll see what, how this relates to the final outcomes, for instance, in April. Um, I'm talking of, uh, you know, in April we have the Easter ho holidays, and so maybe those numbers will still be pushed up by those walking clients. So those are the points I wanted to make. There are other slides, but I think all those other slides, you can see them in the, um, you can find, you can, yeah, we'll put them out in the, in the regular package when they are, pu they are published. All right. I wanted to say a few things before finishing. Uh, I know I have really been talking for a long time. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I want to say a few things first on, on the banking sector and, uh, and I think here we make the point that it is stable and resilient, adequate capital, liquidity, et cetera, um, as at end 2022. Now, the, the issue here is that uh, credit risk remains a concern. This has been the case right from the beginning of COVID, but even a little before that. Uh, credit risk has been um, a concern and uh, has been with us all this time. And uh, I think we reported, for instance, the NPLs um, as a ratio of gross loans. And this actually uh, now stands at 14%, as indicated in the press release. And, uh, and this is really the increase from, let's say, 13.1 that we reported in December, really relates to about, it's about 40 billion Kenya shillings in terms of the facilities that, uh, or the loans that, uh, that uh, led to that increase in uh, that ratio and relate to something like 16 accounts or 16 loans. So they are, they are not, the point to make is this is not systemic across the sectors or for that matter, even in a particular sector like manufacturing, uh, it is true there are a few of those loans that were in the manufacturing sector, but manufacturing has continued to perform very well. But for this specific, uh, let's say, institution that had borrowed um, because of uh, issues that are specific to them, uh, those loans have now been classified as NPLs. I think it is important to also make the point, and this is a point that we remind you, that it's, it, to compare NPL ratios across countries uh, isn't always, uh, uh, let's say, an appropriate comparison. Why? Because during this time, the COVID period, uh, some of the, some of our, in some jurisdictions, they actually did, um, let's say, there was a bit of forbearance, quote unquote. And therefore, the NPLs um, did not increase as they should have because, in effect, those uh, non-performing loans were defined as, not, as uh, proper loans, so they were not defined as non-performing. I guess that's a detail of cross-country comparisons, but I think we've been very aggressive in terms of the definition, remained with it, and uh, also in terms of making sure that uh, the banks classify the loans correctly. Looking ahead, uh, the issue with banks is clear. Um, the issue now is for banks to, con to begin lending to their specific clients 
who are in the in the uh, real sector, and uh, and I think or in the production sectors, and and I think this is something that we have mentioned before, and banks have uh, for the most part gotten together and we have approved a lot of their business models and their pricing and uh, because they they need to follow the pricing that we indicated in the context of our um, banking uh, our banking sector charter the the banking charter that we mentioned um, so risk based pricing customer centricity etc those are trans, um, transparency those are elements that uh, they need to continue to follow so i think we are making progress in that direction we also know that a few banks have actually gotten um, specific loans that are targeted for the SME sector, and we are looking forward to that as well. Um, I think banks have not just waited. They've talked to, let's say, lenders who are willing to provide those loans um, at a better rate, you know, more favorable rate for the specific uh, sectors in the SME. Um, I would also say that uh, in terms of the impact of the, the war, Russian-Ukraine war, on the banking sector, it's negligible to nil. Um, first is we didn't have, the banks didn't have any exposure uh, in, the, in those two countries, and now we are talking on the balance sheet side, so in terms of the assets uh, in those countries, meaning through those countries even. Um, and uh, I think in Europe, generally, uh, exposure to Eurozone countries is something like maybe 6.6 percent, less than 7 percent um, of the foreign country exposure in, as at uh, February 2022. And, and I think we are okay with that. To finish, uh, I want to make maybe four points. The first is uh, we have issued, uh, as you know, uh, a discussion paper on the um, on the central bank dig digital currencies, and uh, that is a paper that is on our website. And I encourage you to um, to send in your views. Um, if you locate it on the website, there's a location that you can actually send whatever views you have. Um, I already talked about it, and there's an interview that is on our website as well um, that was done with. Uh, uh, Julian's uh, interviewed me of NTV, and I think it's also available on YouTube. Um, then there was the national payment strategy that we issued uh, also in February, March. And uh, this really sets out the vision that we have of the, of the national payments, uh, of that space, the payment space. And it is, uh, it's one that I would recommend you to see. I mean, to actually go and uh, locate it on our website as well. And uh, there are many points there, but I think the one point I would want to emphasize is our vision. And our vision of the national payments uh, space is of a secure, fast, efficient, and collaborative payment system that supports financial inclusion and innovations that benefit Kenyans. So that's our vision, and we encourage all innovators um, that are in this space uh, to look at it and actually begin to align themselves uh, to, uh, to the vision and everything else that's discussed there. We also recently, thirdly, we also recently um, started the uh, regulation or let's say supervision of the digital credit lenders. And uh, again, the regulations that support that and the law have all been approved and uh, gazetted. So we are now, as I said, we are now in business. And we have asked any, anyone who is in this space, um, so-called digital credit lender, to, uh, to get in touch with us. And the information is also available on our website how to do that. So we are looking forward to um, moving ahead quickly in this space. Finally, uh, I think the, we also had recently um, uh, yes, it was reported, at least in today's papers, that uh, uh, development with regard to the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, um, and uh, 
uh, its membership or you know moving towards membership in the East African community. And uh, obviously we are looking forward to that progress and I for one am looking forward to welcoming the, the governor of the Central Bank of the Democratic Republic of Congo um, into the let's say yeah into in w into the monetary affairs committee um, on behalf of the others but indeed also as one of us you know one of us um, in that space however uh, it is important to note that uh, they have not yet become members um, the decisions were made yesterday and the progress is that they will receive um, uh, the summit decided that, uh, well, first the summit decided to admit DRC as a full member of the EAC. And uh, the president, our president, as the chairperson of the summit, will sign the treaty of accession of the DRC into the, uh, into the EAC by April 14. So once that is signed and it is then transmitted to the uh, to the country concerned, the DRC, um, they will ratify the treaty of accession. So that is important, ratification. And then after ratification, deposit the instruments of ratification with the ESC Secretary General before September 29, 2022. Obviously they can do it much sooner. And I think everybody's encouraging them to, uh, to process the ratification quickly um, and we look forward to, to, to welcoming them, as I said. Obviously, it is important for us, all of us in Africa and indeed the East African community, because this is a large economy and uh, also large population, population of about 92 million people. And uh, of course, has a lot of resources, has many challenges like we all do. And uh, I think the idea of uh, strengthening the regional um, the regional contacts, as it were, um, the regional connections, is something that is obviously important for ourselves. So thank you very much. I have uh, been speaking for an hour, and now I'm open to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Governor. That was the Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Njeroge, uh, giving the background to the Monetary Policy Committee meeting that was held yesterday and also a lot more data and information. Uh, we'll now jump straight through to the questions that uh, are coming through from you. And as a reminder, please make sure you give us your name and your institution as you ask your question. Uh, so from this batch, the first one is from Antoinette Rusi of the Financial Times. Antoinette asks, what is your view of the West's sanctions against Russia, given they are hurting the Kenyan economy? Is this a new Cold War? Are they as bad as each other? Razia Khan, who's a chief economist for the Africa and the Middle East uh, at Standard Chartered, uh, has two questions. The first one, in view of Kenya's medium-term debt, re debt redemption profile, what is the optimal uh, FX policy? Despite rising import pressure, KE, that is Kenya, has weathered this well. The second question from Razia, what is a CBK's expectation on the continuity of fuel price subsidies in helping to curb current pressures associated with imported oil. Okay. Thank you. So the first question, thank you. So the first question from uh, Antonella. Uh, I think we, in this I think, I, would, I, would, uh, I, I wouldn't want to, exp I can only talk about the economics. So let's stick to the economics. Uh, we do understand the reason for the sanctions is not economics, meaning it is uh, the bigger issue to ensure that Russia uh, refrains and indeed withdraws uh, from Ukraine. That is the, um, the, the describe, that is the reason for what they are doing. But I think the point is that yes, we are hurting, but I think we should also accept that uh, um, it is nowhere near the pain that the Ukrainian people are facing. And uh, I think this is something we've seen in our own region. And uh, so I think the point that uh, there is sort of spillover damage 
on our economies, we have to brace and, re and, uh, and appreciate that uh, it's a small price to pay for what is much more significant for the Ukrainian people, for the, um, I guess, the people of uh, all of us, you know, all of us global citizens. So we leave that. In terms of whether it's a Cold War, et cetera, I think uh, those I would rather leave for the uh, political commentators. The question about uh, debt redemption profile. Um, I think, uh, Razia, you're asking how does that relate to the optimal FX policy. I think the FX policy for us, as we have it, has really served Kenya well. I, I, I want to stress that meaning it has allowed us and it has allowed us to sort of accommodate the shocks the real the real shocks that come to us and let's say terms of trade shocks and i think that is something that we have seen through the covid period um, and uh, something that we'll continue to see going forward it's amazing that uh, something as much as the, that obviously looks risky um, always looks risky, can be that beneficial. So our foreign exchange policy has really been beneficial to us. The, on the other hand, in terms of uh, debt profile, etc., currently we have particular debt, so we can only, in a particular composition, currency composition, etc. But I think looking forward, one can argue that uh, we need to be more careful about the composition of uh, our external debt. Um, and I think uh, the point here is the currency composition is something that we need to be uh, more careful about, aligning it, for instance, um, closer to, let's say, our exports, um, let's say the currency with, with which we get our exports, so perhaps even picking up a few more euro-denominated debt, et cetera. But it isn't, uh, it isn't just uh, something for now. It is something that we need to do going forward because, as you know, even pricing, those markets are not working well. So let's not only look at the currency element, but rather overall, uh, overall let's say, issues with regard to debt profile. And uh, yes, on uh, rising import pressure, it is true. And this is particularly on the, yeah, I think Kenya has weathered well. You, your assessment is right. And we expect that we'll continue to weather that well because we can see where the pressures are coming from and we know how to deal with that. Um, fuel subsidies, I think, uh, in Kenya, we do expect that will remain. Uh, but I think, importantly, uh, it will, it, does, it may not be at 100%. There may be a sort of uh, an adjustment so we are not saying that there will never be any adjustment. There may be adjustment that puts some burden on consumers. But uh, we do expect that uh, there will be a significant burden that is picked up by the government through the fuel price subsidies. Two things to mention there. Um, it has to be short term. It cannot be long term. And we have seen uh, how some countries can get caught up in this and be unable to uh, remove it in the long term. And I think the issue there has to be we are looking forward to the actions by the advanced economies to lower those prices down. I mean, prices at $100 a barrel uh, are completely you know, beyond the realm of understanding. So I think the point here is the actions that they can do uh, will be beneficial, and that will allow us to withdraw the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the subsidies at the right time. So that's all I would want to say. But obviously, you appreciate that uh, subsidy, uh, this issue of subsidy, even as it is and it impacts on uh, prices and inflation, is something that is more of a fiscal, uh, yeah, fiscal issue, um, fiscal co concern or fiscal question. Uh, the second batch of questions will begin with David Herbling from uh, Bloomberg News. David asks. What will be the impact in percentage points of the recent fuel price increase on March inflation? From Kefa Moirori of Citizen Digital, by how much will the renewed global volatility or cost pressures affect your GDP growth projection for 2022 currently at 5.9% as per the presentation? 
Uh, and the third question from Jimmy Mbogo of Business Hour. How is a move by Russia to require that oil transactions be done in Russian rubles going to affect the foreign exchange market in Kenya? So first, uh, in, in terms of David Heblin's question, I don't have the precise numbers in terms of in percentage points, um, but I would encourage you to calculate it yourself. Um, so that is that. Um, in terms of Kefa's question, uh, the volatility, again, as I said, our, our growth projection has not uh, changed uh, from what we had before. And I thought I explained why it has not changed. Um, first and foremost is the connection with the other, with the Ukraine and indeed uh, Russia. And I made the point that that is actually not significant. They are not significant trading partners for us. Um, so I don't think there will be, you can say that the growth, the GDP growth projections will, be, will deviate dramatically from that. Of course, the impact, the indirect impact is through global growth. So a sort of a scaling back of global growth will obviously affect us. But I think the point here is we had already seen that in the context of COVID-19. And, uh, and I think it wasn't as significant. So let's uh, keep it at, and that's why we kept it at 5.9. And as we go forward, we'll see, we'll update our projections. Um, Jimmy's question about uh, oil and uh, paying for oil in Russian rubles. I think the point here is that first we, are not, we don't buy oil from Russia, so that's that. But I think it points to a, a risk in the, in the financial markets, or let's say in the global trade markets, in the global markets, uh, where actually transactions, uh, so there's, some, there's some sort of, let's say, uh, breaking, breaking up of the frameworks that were there before. And, uh, and I think what this will do is that it will, in the long run, it will probably just mean there will be more currencies that will be used for trades, um, and the dominance of the U.S. Uh, dollar will decline. But I think that is a much long, I mean, it may happen maybe with regard to the trades that are there between Russia and Europe and et cetera, um, particularly on the oil, but also on the gas, et cetera. But I, it's not a foregone conclusion that that will happen, though. And even if it happens, um, we don't expect a complete change in, in that space, let's say a sea change in the, next, uh, in the near future. So, but for us, the FX market, no, it, that won't have any impact on uh, our FX market. From Constant Munda of the Business Daily, uh, what is the progress uh, in the journey towards positioning Kenya as a premier green finance hub under the CBK guideline on climate-related risk management? Uh, Jimmy Mbogo again, uh, what is the status of the EAC regional currency and is this going to be affected by the CBK digital currency? Uh, and lastly, from Charles Moniki of the Business Daily, how many banks have had their risk-based lending models approved so far? Okay. So in terms of the first question, constant, um, I think here I can only say that uh, we are making progress with the specific uh, institutions, in this case banks. One of the things we have had to do is to get into a, well, to do a lot of training. And this has been going on very well at all levels. Began with the CEOs and then worked our way into the various sort of managers, et cetera. Um, we need to appreciate that this is not uh, sort of a quick uh, outcome or low-hanging fruit sort of uh, scenario. Uh, it is something that requires effort, requires constancy. I like the ring of, I'm sure you like the ring of that constant. So constancy and uh, eventually we'll, we'll get the fruits of this. Of course, there are also other things. There are two institutions. Well, first, the sovereign. The, um, there, is cons there is discussion about, uh, you know, going issuing a green bond. Um, that has been coming. That has been around for some time. But I think it's something that will happen 
uh, eventually. I cannot tell you when, but it will eventually happen for sure. And then, of course, there is a, there's another bank. Uh, there's a bank, and indeed, this is KCB Bank, that is also thinking of going into the green bond, issuing a green bond. Um, I think the issue here is not the issuance per se. That is the easy part. The easy part, the harder part is working with the investors, um, meaning like in the case of KCB, they are using that money for investment in green projects, etc. And uh, and we, I hope you appreciate that we are not just thinking, you know, large uh, wind turbines. No, there are many other projects that uh, we need to put together to make them uh, sort of a, an appropriate package. Um, status of ESC regional currency, that hasn't changed. Um, uh, we issued a press release, I guess, about a month ago, a little less than a month ago, after the meeting on uh, uh, the, the Monetary Affairs Committee. I chaired that meeting. And, uh, and we, should, we gave a status report on this. But the point is that uh, your question is, will this affect the CBK digital currency? I don't know. If you have a question, please throw it in there. Um, I think this is a good question. Ask that question. Um, I don't want to be the one that's giving answers. It is you. It is you who should be telling me what your concerns are. Moniki's question about how many banks, I cannot tell you the number. I can only tell you that we have, we've made very good progress um, on these risk-based lending models. And again, we will, those banks that we haven't, uh, um, let's say, cleared their, their model, their lending models, business models, we'll work with them. We are working with them. And uh, for them to actually come up with uh, a proper, uh, something that is fit for purpose. Thank you, and uh, that is it from uh, the question and answer session. Um, this press conference, as we told you, and is the one that you will expect coming after the Monetary Policy Committee meeting. So we shall expect another press conference uh, after the next Monetary Policy Committee meeting that at this moment is scheduled for May, but as a press release says, the MPC may meet at any point if the circumstances uh, call for it. For now, thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning into the afternoon. We thank you and we shall see you at the next one.